Let me read to you a passage from the 17th chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 26 to 37. It's the Gospel for Friday of the 32nd week in Ordinary Time. St. Luke writes, Jesus said, Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day, le the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, Two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together, one will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? they asked. He replied, Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. That's from Luke chapter 17, verses 26 to 37. What does it suggest to us? Well, it speaks of law and punishment. What do I mean? Well, I have heard it said that a fundamental interest of the Muslim mind is law. And in particular, of course, Muslim law. Law in the Muslim mind would appear to be an ultimate category. And from the Christian perspective, it may be so ultimate as to render in situations of dialogue an evaluation extremely difficult. I mention this merely as an introduction to the great fact of law in the life of mankind. In the matter of ultimate categories, of course, inasmuch as man and things exist, existence is the most basic principle of all, and it is closely followed by essence, because Nothing can be, but must be of a certain shape or kind. That granted, law is undoubtedly a central feature of the life of mankind. The moment man arrives at a stage of self-reflection and reason, he discovers and is confronted by law. He is not allowed to do this and must do that. His conscience tells him that this is to be avoided and that is to be done, or may be done. All through his schooling he is met with regulations, and the sanctions that accompany them. He comes to, his own, to own his own vehicle, and regulations about its use appear to right and left. In both civil life and in his religion, law is everywhere, more often warning of punishment on violation than promising reward on compliance. The reward of compliance to law is, well, the right and benefit to continue on one's present course, generally. If one does not comply with the law, not only will the present course be blocked, but sanctions will be imposed by lawful authority. Sanctions can be severe and can include the very loss of life. But this is to be noticed, and this is actually my point here that people of every time and place take law for granted, whether it is or is not the ultimate category in their thinking. The fact of law in society is accepted, as is the constant threat of sanctions from society if there is non-compliance. We all accept this threat and actually regard it as a benefit. Revealed religion is no different in this respect from ordinary life. The theme of divine law revealed by God himself to and for his chosen people, 
pervades revealed religion. Furthermore, there is the ever-present threat of sanctions for non-compliance. It is the most natural thing in the world. If one thumbs through the Old Testament, the imposition of law and the threat of punishment for non-compliance is frequent and obvious. God placed the man in the garden to cultivate and care for it, but then he gave him an order. He was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The moment he cho chooses to eat of it, he is doomed to die. It was a capital offence. And yet the man and the woman chose to contravene this law, and they suffered the penalty. All through the Old Testament, God is warning his people to obey his law. If they refuse to obey his law, he promises that his wrath will descend upon them. So much is this the case that it is often said that the God of the Old Testament, as it's put, is a God of law, punishment and wrath. He is contrasted with the God of the New Testament, as it's put, who is said to be a God of love and compassion. This, of course, is a caricature, which brings me to my second point, the first being the presence of law and punishment in life and religion. The fact is that Jesus Christ is shown in the Gospels to be a teacher of divine law and punishment also. He is in the line of the prophets and of the Old Testament generally. That is not to say that he is teacher of law and punishment only. This would be manifestly absurd, for his revelation is that of the boundless love of God. But as with the Old Testament prophets, who also taught the love of God for his people, Jesus Christ teaches constantly and consistently that God has imposed his law on man and there are sanctions for non-compliance. There are capital offences which if committed bring death and only God can raise from the dead. Our gospel passage today from Luke chapter 17 verses 26 to 37 is an instance of this pattern. Our Lord reminds his audience of the judgment of God on the people of Noah's day. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, we read, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulphur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. There's nothing mealy-mouthed about this. They were put to death because of their sins. It will be just like that our Lord warns when he comes again. Just as there was the judgment of God in the Old Testament, so there will be the judgment of God in the day of the Son of Man. Our Lord warns his audience, remember Lot's wife. Our Lord decidedly does not say to his audience, well, all that business about God judging sinners that you have read in the Old Testament, well, that is rather passé. In fact, truth to tell, it's a bit of an embarrassment in view of what you see in me. No. It is all very much to be borne in mind. The thought of the divine judgment exercises the mind wonderfully and helps keep it focused on the greatest thing of all, which is God's love.